So good afternoon and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Rob Romanowski. I'm the Director of Sales Operations with 3HTI. And today uh, we're going to look at mechanism uh, design and kinematics within Creo. Uh, Paul Dye, who is a solutions consultant and applications engineer with PTC's Virtual Center of Excellence, is going to give us a uh, presentation overview as well as a live demo of these capabilities in Creo. Some of these capabilities are standard with Creo, others require the extension. And um, I'm going to let Paul give you some more insight to that. So Paul, your screen is visible. Take it away. And by the way, this is going to take about 20 minutes for the presentation and demo, and then we'll have Q&A after the fact. So type your uh, questions in. Paul, it's all yours. All right, perfect. Thank you, Rob. And thanks for having me on. Happy to go through and talk at what I really think of as an underserved area from within Creo, right? I think this is something that uh, people tend to have focused on areas like FEA and analysis and general design, but there's a big difference whenever you start to take into account the real world into the designs that we're working with, right? And there's a lot of challenges that come into this and a lot of things that we really have tools to address from within the context of Creo, some just within the base of Creo, and then some that we have a specific extension called the Mechanism Dynamics extension to particularly address. I'll be going through and laying out the differences between these. I'll be going through and showing some examples of what this looks like to work with from within the context of Creo. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A and we can definitely get to those and hopefully provide some insight. So with that, I'll go ahead and first start just by some of the challenges that we typically see out in the industry whenever it comes to working with mechanisms, right? A lot of times we design models that don't move, maybe a building, something like a framework. That's perfectly fine, right? I can put parts together, say this one goes on top of that one. And that's really the way that it works out in the real world. But there's a lot of designs that actually do move. Most times the designs that we work with at the end of the day have some sort of moving component to them. And we need to be able to take that into account. It tends to add a lot of complexity, a lot of new challenges that traditionally we aren't very well equipped to support with, right? Especially whenever our CADs designs look very good on the computer, it looks like it's working perfectly, but it's not the real world, right? It's all still a virtual design. If your engineers are still assembling things that are supposed to move with things like fixed constraints, you're missing out. You know, the truth of the matter is you don't just have one part sitting on top of the other. You have pin joints, you have sliders, you have all these different movement pieces that you have from one part of the assembly to the next. Need to be able to take that into account and really the best designs actually take those mechanisms and work that into part of the design exploration take into account the kinet the kinematic the dynamic behavior how the model is going to move and that's going to be very important when we're making a design better the first time around one thing that a lot of people do is just build it out as a prototype just to realize that a certain component doesn't work correctly and then you build another prototype and you build another one because right? you're trying to go through and figure out a specific linkage where if you were able to just go through and look at that from within the context of Creo, you probably could have avoided that. You know, a lot of times that process is very expensive. It can be time consuming and it's ultimately not giving us the best design. And that's really what we're trying to do here is we're really trying to get to the best designs out of this. So to combat all this, we have different solutions from within Creo to work that into the designs that we're designing, right? And there's really two main areas I'm gonna cover. First and foremost is going to be the mechanism design capabilities that just come standard from within Creo Parametric. These are your tools right from within Creo for simulating mechanisms, looking at ranges of motion, checking for interferences, and integrating that all into the assemblies that you're working with. And secondly, we're going to be taking a look at the mechanism dynamics option or MDO. This is an extension that gives you extended capabilities to design and test the mechanisms that you create under real world stresses. We're starting to now take into account and simulate forces, accelerations that are happening in these different moving components, taking into account the interferences or influences from springs, motors, friction, gravity, whatever it may be. So I'm gonna go through and define each of these. We'll start first and foremost here with the mechanism, dynam uh, mechanism design extension. And first and foremost, what we're doing here is working with the ability to define mechanisms. So not just putting things on top of one another, but actually defining how they're gonna be working out in the real world. Things like pins, sliders, ball joints, really giving me the ability to build out different components for those specific functions. And once I have those different components together into a mechanism, I can then run analyses. I can 
drag components around. I can apply motors to drive them over a certain time frame. It's not just the size and the shape of the models, but have the motion of the components actually be part of the design as well. And one of the biggest things around this is though everything that we're doing is right from within Creo. It's just sending capabilities. It's an application that's available right at the top of the screen. Gives us all the different capabilities that we have available to us in the assembly. So completely integrated in that sense. And the actions that we're taking are real time. You can see right here in the picture or in this video, I can drag components around based on how I have my design built out. It's gonna move everything around for me as well. That also includes things like interference detection. It, if you have a prototype built out, right? That's a bad time to figure out that there's an interference. It's much better to do that simulation right from within Creo, take the model through its full range of motion. And if you have any issues, be able to very clearly see that. Another thing that we work with here is area claim and the creation of motion envelopes. Both very good features of mechanism design. You can take a look at the area that the part moves. You can go ahead and visualize that right from within your assembly to make sure that you don't have other parts moving from within that space. You can also build out things such as trace curves to see as a part's moving through its path, you can make a curve along that. You'll have to see the extent of the movement. You can also go through and build around it, build on top of it, build off of it. Lots of different options there. And everything that we build and analyze, it can all be saved. All the different pin joints, the ball joints, they really just become part of the assembly. It's not a separate thing, it's not a separate world, it just gets saved right with the assembly and something that you can always reference back to later on. So again, I'm gonna go through and show what this all looks like. And these are all just standard capabilities that we work with right from within Creo. So building out the designs on how they're gonna work out in the real world. But then there's another side to this. What happens when you need to start taking into account the forces? Right? This is really where mechanism dynamics comes into play. This is anywhere where we might have things breaking, right? any issues in that sense. Let's take some more variables into account here. So we're gonna use all those motions that we started with, but now let's go ahead and simulate the forces that are actually created by those different components. And we'll study them to make sure that they're gonna work correctly, the extensions taking into account real world behavior and building it into the design. Things like springs, where you define a pitch, the strength, the size, system fully understands how that works and understands things like stored force, release force, bounce back. Works very similarly with other mechanisms as well. But what we're doing now is really true kinematic analysis, taking into account position, velocity, acceleration, all within the context of the parts. There's really a lot of different features and parameters to take into account. You can see even with just kind of like a simple assembly like this, there's so many different things happening here. You have springs, you have dampers, contacts, friction, you know, Things that are happening out in the real world, what kind of forces are you going to get? How does that all come into play? Well, we can take that into account here right from within Creo. And Mechanism Dynamics is doing all this work for us. And whenever it's done, be able to share that off with different graphing capabilities and see what your torque is on certain head pins, certain positions, what's the acceleration velocity, really anything that you need in that sense. Look at your reaction forces, see what you're going to get at different points, graph it all out. and once you gather all, all that information and be able to share it off, share animations, tabular outputs, different options in that sense. And one of the biggest things I want to mention here before we go through and look at this is how we would actually take this and make good use of it. A lot of times the next logical step is once you understand the forces that you're going to get, take them over into your simulation. So you can take them over into your Creo Simulate tool, Simulation Live, and really understand the impact of those different forces that you're getting. Also works well with multiple other extensions, behavior modeling, if that's a tool they haven't worked with before, it's really helping us to see, for example, based on the forces that you collected, exactly how thick or thin a particular section needs to be, right? Or like I said, even the other direction, right? How thin can we make a part, but then still stay within a certain factor of safety, right? Either way, behavior modeling is really good for things like that. Also works with tools like MathCAD, and it, that's if you haven't worked with that it's a digital engineering notebook for performing different calculations managing design intent so if you're doing calculations over there you could go through and take your calculations to push them into mechanism or if you wanted to push your results over into mathcad and document that you could do that as well so really at the end of the day just looking to do all this virtual product analysis take into account all these different factors and really work into the most optimal design that you can there now I'm gonna go through and show exactly what this looks like from within the context of Creo. Again, if you have any questions throughout this, if you have anything that you need me to explain any further, or anything that maybe I glossed over that we need to take a step back on, feel free to add that in as well. All right, 
I'm going to go ahead and dive into it. So I'm going to have this split up into two main sections. I'm going to start first and foremost by going through just some of the different mechanism design capabilities, things that are standard with Creo. And then the second half will be more so on the dynamic section of this. So again, working with that particular module that we would do to work with that. So for our demonstration, I'm going to be working with this assembly for a turbine system. As you can see, a lot of different components going on here. We can go ahead and take a closer look into some of these as well. So let's first go ahead and hide the structure assembly that goes around this whole thing. And I just want to focus in here on these different mechanisms that we have. So you can see we have the blades, we have some different supports. It's all attached to a door that we can see up at the top. So let's, for, let's focus in on one of these. Let's go ahead and take a look at the linkage that we have to this door. Let's go ahead and open up the subassembly that we have for this. This is the hydraulic dampening linkage. So it means that these other two center pieces move against each other. And I can open this up to see how it's assembled. And you can imagine how you would typically do something like this. Maybe you would do a coincident along the axis, maybe a concentric along the faces, and then maybe another coincident to have it all the way in. But now it's just stuck there. Maybe you could try to do a distance mate, specify how far in or out it is. But again, that's not really taking into account what's happening in the real world. It can go as far as short as I want there. So what I'm going to start and do first is delete that. And now let's work with a slider constraint because that's really what's happening here. So working with something like this, you can see the slider centered, it's aligned, but now what we have the ability to do is put translation constraints on this. So to do that, we'll have a plane that we have here. We'll tell the system that it aligns with the face that we have at the edge of the part. And now we essentially have the same type of, of constraint as before, but now this is actually gonna be something that's useful for us going forward. So you can see that you have different values, different parameters that you can go through and apply with that slider. I can go back into my full linkage here and use my drag components feature and see it works just how I think it would. It moves right along the axis through the middle of those two parts. But the problem is it's still moving anywhere that it wants. But that's one of the nice things about the slider here is what we could do is go back and put different minimums or maximum limits on where those different components can move. So maybe the minimum will be zero right up to that datum plane. And then the maximum will be just around 30 millimeters. So really adding in design intelligence into the model. So you can see back here in the full linkage, if I was to drag my, drag my cursor, it's not going to go outside of the bounds for that, but it could go anywhere from within that. So really working how it would out in the real world. You can also take a look at the clevis in the back here. Right now, we just have a couple of different coincident mates. It's not really doing what I want it to do. So let's go ahead and take this and delete the standard constraints, right? It's definitely not working. So let's instead use one of the connections that we have laid out in our list, right? So you can see some of the different options that you have here. You have pin, slider, cylindrical, planar, ball, bearing, things that we would use out in the real world. We can go through and have this applied here from within our assembly. And in this case, it's going to be a pin joint. So we'll basically say that we want to align that pin to a certain axis. And now we can only move it up and down on there. We'll define the translation of that pin joint. Go ahead and get that face. And we're looking pretty good. So now we have really a real life pin joint. System understands that behavior. Every other component that we work with moves right along with it. So anything that's really meant to be fixed, you could leave and just use your standard constraints. But if it's meant to move, then instead, let's go ahead and use these different mechanism constraints. The question now does become, what does that actually do back in my main assembly? Well, let's go ahead and flip back over there. And we can regenerate for the changes that we made there. And let's just try dragging some things around. So if I move this turbine, how are all the other components going to react to that? Well, based on how I define the linkage and that pin joint, you can see how everything relaxed or how it reacts there. It's looking pretty good. I also have the idea of snapshots. At particular moments in space, what you could do is take a snapshot and remember that particular configuration. So right now we have this closed. So we can go ahead and define that as a snapshot. And we'll just call it closed. And then we can drag it all the way back open as well and take another snapshot. And easy enough for that one, we'll just call it open. And now what we could do is at any point in the process, toggle between each of the snapshots, allows me to set the assembly up however I need to position it. And now we can go through here and add in some more intelligence. So we'll go ahead and open up the assembly for this actuator here. This is the piece that's actually going to push this whole thing open. 
it's another hydraulic piece. Maybe we've gone through and put a slider joint on it right now, like we saw earlier with that linkage. So now it's moving the way that we want, but now instead of me just dragging it, what I wanna do is define a mechanism for this piece. So here using the mechanism design capabilities, we have all the features for defining and analyzing the mechanisms that we create with this. You can see it has a dedicated model tree down here for the mechanisms, all the conditions, the settings that we wanna work with are gonna be right there. In my case here, what I wanna use is a servo motor. I wanna move this piece out a certain distance along a particular axis. So to do that, we'll apply a velocity motor and we can change our definition to define either the position, the velocity or the acceleration. You have different options for the magnitude as well, but for this one, we'll just keep it at a constant. Okay. And I know how far I want this assembly to open, so we'll just quickly give that a value. It's always something that you can play around with later, but the idea is instead of me just dragging things around, I can instead set up an analysis. So this analysis takes the mechanisms over a particular time frame with certain drivers. In this case, it'll be that servo motor that I just went through and defined. And let's go ahead and run that. So essentially what we're doing here is defining motion across time and we can lay out these different mechanisms, have multiple if we'd like to, and let that run through. And it'll take just a second to run that through its full range of motion. All right, and after you've run the analysis, the system would tell you if there's any issues. In our case, we're good to go. And once it's been run, we have the ability to go back. We can play through that analysis if we'd like to. If we were in a design review, if we want to save off an animation of this, you could do that. And it's easy to work with. You could speed this up, you could slow it down, you could zoom in on a particular area. If you wanted to capture this as an animation, if you wanted to share off that analysis animation with a colleague of yours, very easy to do as well. All right, now from here, we can also take some measurements for other values that we want to see. For example, here, maybe you want to know what's the measurement from pin to pin as you move through that analysis. All we can do is take a point here from the top of the clevis and run that through the analysis. We can even get a graph of those values as well. And this one in particular is going to be pretty simple, as you can see. It might get a little bit more complex as we go along here. But now what I can see is at certain time frames exactly what that distance is. All right, that's a good look at how the analysis and the motion works within that subassembly. We can go ahead and move back here into the full assembly as well. And we can take a look at how this process would work with all these different components that we're working with laid out, right? So just as we did before, what I'm going to set up is an analysis over a given time frame, And we're going to apply that same actuator motor that we defined earlier. And we, we really just tell it from start to finish, right? As it's going to run through that full of range of motion. And it's going to do that until it hits one of the constraints that we have defined in our components and it runs out and tells the analysis to stop. And once it stops, we can go through and look at the different values. We can take measurements of the things that we're concerned with. In this case here, I want to check the angle of my hinge, tell me how far that it's opening at that point. We can just select the axis there and we're good to go. All right, so now what we'll do is take that hinge angle and we're going to measure it through the range and then give me a graph of it. So go ahead and select that here. And then see what we get back. I have that graph down here. And based on this, you can actually see that it pulls in a little bit before it would release. So is it right? Is it wrong? Well, we're right in Grio. Just simply go back, change it just as fast if you need to. And now we can go ahead and close that assembly back up. And from here, add in a little bit more complexity. So let's go right down here to our latch. So this latch is actually a cam situation where we want to grab the outside surfaces of the hook, the surfaces of the pin. And in this case, we want to enable lift off, which means whenever we move that pin, the latch has to get out of the way. So really in this case, starting to apply some intelligence to the model. So my component here, as you can see here, has to move out of the way right up into the point wherever it's clear. And this can have an effect on all my different mechanisms. How far can things move? Is there going to be an interaction between the parts? And once we have that set up, we can go back, take that through, and rerun that back through the analysis to see how it's going to work. And we'll go ahead and let that run back through here. And looking at this, you can see the latch moved out of the way just fine. 
went a little bit too far. Looks like we might have to add a limit on there. But again, as you saw, quick and easy to do. And now you could go back through, look at any points throughout that analysis, and work with it from there. Another quick one that I can show here as well is a trace curve. So suppose the bottom of that pin that we just went through and worked with, where it goes is very important. Maybe I want to make sure that it clears something, or I may want to even build something around it like a slot. Well, after we run that analysis, we can just simply go back. We can then generate a curve off of that, and it's going to follow right along the path. It's very easy to go back and inspect it. So we look at that. And the idea is I could go build off of that curve, something like a follow or a slot for the pin, or build out other geometry just to make sure that it's not going to interfere there in that sense. So again, everything that I worked with there, it's all just done using our standard mechanism design capabilities, just all right from within Creel. So I can take a, a pause here before we move on to some of the mechanism dynamics capabilities. Any questions on anything so far? Uh, question is, is it possible to share this model? That's a good question. Uh, one that I don't have the answer to. I'm not sure if this is something internal to PTC or not. I can go through and check on that. Um, if not, there might be some available in the Creo tutorials. There might be some good mechanism examples that you could work with just out of the Creo help pages. Fair enough. All right. All right. Cool. So from here, we can go ahead and move into the next section of this with MDO or mechanism dynamics option. So again, not just the motions and how things move, but now we're going to start to consider some forces that go into this. So we could work back here with our actuator. Now, instead of a servo motor running this, maybe this one is actually going to be spring loaded. It's oftentimes how actuators are built. So with that, there's a lot more that we have to consider. So we can go ahead and start to set that up. First thing I'll do is turn on our endpoints. We want to add in the spring between those two endpoints. And with that, you have options for the strength of the spring, the uncompressed length. The system understands that and is going to build us a spring right on top of that. And this isn't just a static piece. I have a lot of options that, for this that I can go through, change the diameter, how I want it to look. So now whenever we start to drag that actuator around, we can see how the spring is going to react. We can see if we compress it, what it looks like. If it's uncompressing, what that will look like as well. And as it's doing that, it's applying a force. And with that force, we can then take that. We can utilize it over in our analysis. And it's going to create an entirely new scenario for the assembly. So with this, instead of the servo motor pushing that door and the assembly open, we're instead going to use this spring that we built to do that same process. And really the same general interface for setting up that analysis. You can work with it. You can shorten up the time frame and go ahead and show me what happened there. All right. Now, once we have that, we can go through and add in more complexity. Again, this spring, it's not just compression. We also want to take into account things like friction, really a lot of parameters that you can change around. So this one in particular, we're going to go ahead and add in a coefficient of restitution, essentially allowing our spring to reach a steady state by the end of its motion. And we can see what effect that restitution has on the analysis. So we can quickly go back through here, run back through that analysis again, and then take a look at what we got back here. So at the end of this, it's likely going to be uncompressing. It's actually going to rebound a little bit due to some of the parameters that we changed. And once you have the playback, you can go through, look at it. You can see at any time slice, slow it down, send it off as an animation as well. So we can still take different measurements if we'd like to as well. We can go back through here and look at the position for the example. Um, but with this being a spring system, we can see how that measurement is going to change. We can take into account the new forces. We can take a look back at the graph here. The initial uncompressing is fairly nonlinear. You can see that it actually bounces back at the end of the cycle. And at the end, settles out into a steady state at that full uncompressed length. All right, now we can go back and do the same thing, but instead of position, we can instead look at the loads that we're getting. So what kind of loads are going to be on the spring? Well, we can take that analysis, we can graph it up, we can take any of the values from that, share it off. It's really just that easy, right? So take it from there. And once you're happy with the analysis that we've run, what we have the ability to do now is take that back into our full assembly. Let's go ahead and switch back over there. And now we have that spring inside of our system. So what I'm going to do here, first and foremost, is rerun that analysis. Uh, let's go ahead and remove that servo motor. We don't need that now that we have our spring loaded in. And let's go ahead and rerun that. 
and now see the animation for this. You can see that the spring is the driving force that's forcing that latch open. And after that, pushing the turbine assembly out. The next step of that would probably be to maybe make the latch as the starting mechanism for that process. But again, once you go through the analysis, it's easy to go through and take different measurements. With that, you have a lot of options. In our case here, we can take a look at the net loads that we're seeing on our spring. Another feature that we have while we're doing this is the ability to display arrows right along the sources of the loads. And this is going to give us information on the direction of the load as well as the relative magnitude. It's going to make it very visual for us. As you can see here, we have these large arrows that we're working with. You can also see a graph of the loads that we're working with and how those are changing over the certain time frame as well. So not only graphing it out, but again, whenever we do the playback, we can see the spring loads, how they're changing. Go ahead and play back through this animation here. There we go. So it's going to be very visual for us as we're doing this. As we're playing through the animation, you can see the direction is changing. The relative magnitude is also changing. So as it's going through and working, you see the size of the arrows is decreasing as that load is decreasing. Right, very visual way of doing that. All right, so now really starting to understand the design that goes into those mechanisms, also the dynamics that are driving them. And now the final step that you would typically take in this process would be to take all the connections and the forces and then utilize them elsewhere. For example, in our simulation studies. So here, what we could do is select the piece that we want to simulate. We can calculate the loads at the start, the end, go ahead and take them at maximum points if we'd like to. However you want to go through and define that could be at particular points in time as well. Maybe here we'll take that at 0 0.5 seconds. Take a look at the loads that are hitting this particular part of the assembly. And as you can see, you have listed out all the different loads, the connection forces, the moments. We can pick and choose exactly which one we want to see. And from there, we can take the loads that we want to work with and export them out. Now they've just been stored as part of the model, as part of this piece. So very quickly, I can go through and show you what I'm talking about. If we want to work this over in our Creo Simulate tool. If you've never worked for Creo Simulate, this is our finite element analysis tool in Creo. You can see some of these forces that we got from our mechanisms. It's very easy to go back in here, retrieve them, and truly start to take us from end to end here. So we designed the part, put it into motion, applied the loads and the forces, and after we study those forces, take them right over to here and simulate and study whatever situation that we want. So in our case, let's go ahead and run through a quick standard static analysis using the load set that we brought in. Obviously, a lot of capabilities over here in Simulate, but really just looking to show the idea of going from start to finish throughout this. Let's go ahead and run this, take a look at the results that we're getting back using the loads. We can take a look at things such as the stress values, the displacement. We can go ahead and pull this up here as well. As you can see, we can animate on that as well to look at the stress values and go through and interrogate the model as we might need to. All right, so that's really the process of working with both mechanism design and mechanism dynamics, all, again, fully integrated into what you're doing with Creo Parametric. So again, I know I went through and walked through a decent bit there, uh, but really tons of different capabilities. And again, if you've never worked with this in the context of your Creo designs or never really taken these things into account, it's definitely something that I recommend and definitely something that I recommend looking deeper into as well. But that's all Paul, I have to get through there. Paul, nicely done. Can you hear me, Paul? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, I got you, I got you. Nicely done. All right, nicely thank you. Done. I, 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 don't know, I, I think that um, these types of solutions and um. You know, it helps you help you to understand your, your the function of your assembly better, your part better. Um, other extensions like the GD and T advisor, I think these things are becoming more and more popular with Creo users and Creo customers, and um, a lot of uh, SolidWorks customers that are coming over and making the switch to Creo because they know they're getting a much better, much better product as as the end result. So. Nice job uh, with the demo and explaining that and everything. Yeah, and I'll even say one last thing on that as well is it's not just a nice to have. 
working with something like mechanism, it's not nice to have to be able to understand the motion, the interferences of your models. It's something that can really save you, honestly, a lot of money, right? If you go through and build out a prototype that costs $5,000 just to realize that you have a certain interference or a linkage doesn't work, well, that's $5,000 down the drain, right? Something yeah. that you could have done right back from within the context of Korea. So really something that the best designs are really taking into account. Yeah, and it's not just yeah, it's not just the um, it's not just the return on the investment of the software. It's a return on the investment of your um, your engineering department's time in using this and saving them time in in rework or having to uh, redesign a product. So good stuff. So that's going to conclude our webinar. If you have any questions um, that you think of later or you want to contact me, you can respond to the email that I sent you as far as the invitation is concerned for this webinar. They come back directly to me, or you can email us at info at 3hti.com. So we'll have the recording up on our YouTube page by tomorrow, and everybody who registered will receive a link to view this presentation again at your leisure. Paul, once again, thank you very much for um, for your time today and uh, leading us in this webinar. I see another question just popped in, and great demonstration. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. <laughs> so we'll end on a high note. Ah, <laughs> thanks everybody. <laughs>